Now, Rome ruled the world. Rome with its intellectualism, Rome with its militarism, Rome with its laws, Rome with its roads. But Paul writes a letter to a little colony of heaven. They were about to turn Rome upside down. That letter you hold in your hand, it is called by many the Constitution of Christianity. Profound Truth Simply Stated. This is Love Worth Finding with pastor, teacher, and author Adrian Rogers. Would you take God's Word and turn to the book of Romans? And when you've found it, look up here. The book of Romans, chapter 1. You know, books are an interesting thing. I have a library full of books, and my books have been my good friends. I think of uh, books that have changed the world. I think of a madman named uh, Hitler who wrote a book, Mein Kampf, and there in that book, he put his Nazi philosophies. And the outgrowth of that book was a world war with its devastation, the Holocaust and six million Jews put to death, a book written by a diseased mind. Charles Darwin wrote a book, The Origin of the Species. <laughs> he said that, that we are the product of blind evolutionary forces. We were not made, created by Almighty God. And men have read that book and tried to make a monkey of themselves. Make themselves an orphan of the apes. Books have incredible power. But there has been no book that has ever influenced or impacted the world like the book you've just opened and hold in your hand. It is the book of Romans. Now, let's, let's talk a little bit about the, the author of this book of Romans, okay? Now, we know that God the Holy Spirit uh, is the ultimate author. But who was the human author? Well, let's just look here in chapter 1, verse 1. Are you ready? Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of of God. Now, folks, I want to tell you, when I got right here, the first verse, I said, I'll never get finished preaching this first verse, so we're just going to touch the top of it. You, you see, in Bible times, in Bible times, a man did not do what we modern Americans do. We write a letter and sign our name at the end. Have you ever gotten a long letter and you begin to think, who wrote this thing? What is all this about? I, I get frequently, I get letters, three or four or five pages. After a while, I turn the back and see, who, who, who am I reading? Who is this that is talking to me? <laughs> People in Bible times had caller ID. I mean, it was right up here at the front. <laughs> Paul, I want you to know who it is that is writing this letter. I want to give my credentials to begin with. Now, let's just describe him. First of all, you're going to get a blessing out of the very first word, Paul because that wasn't always his name. His name used to be Saul. And who was Saul? When his mother got ready to name him, his mother named him after a king in Israel whose name was Saul. King Saul was head and shoulders above everybody else. King Saul was a handsome but self-willed carnal man. And so the very name Saul reeks with pride. Saul was so filled with pride. And now this Saul that we now call Paul was named after that Saul. And uh, indeed, he was a man himself who had been filled with pride. I mean, this man who wrote this book was an unusual man. First of all, he was a Jew. He was one of the chosen. Uh, and then number two, besides being a Jew, he was a Roman citizen. He was a free man. Besides that, he was an honors graduate from the University of Tarsus. Besides that, uh, he was world travel. On top of that, he was fluent in many languages. On top of that, he had uh, learned at the feet he'd been sent to Jerusalem to sit and to be the personal scholar of Gamaliel, known as the greatest teacher there in the, in the world at that time. And Saul had been taught by Gamaliel. And besides that, he was a Pharisee and besides that, he was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. That is, he was a leader of the leaders. 
He had been petted and praised and prized. Folks, he was a big shot. And he had a big shot name, Saul. But you know what happened? He said, I'm going to change my name. And he changed his name to Paul. Do you know what Paul means? Paul means little. Paul means small. <laughs> this man who had been so arrogant and had been so bold, he met the Lord Jesus, and the Bible says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. So the first thing we learn about old Paul was that he was saved. Now here's the next thing I want you to see. He was separated. Now we're going to spend a little time right here. Notice he was saved. Uh, yes, he was. He was surrendered. Yes, he was. He was sent. And now notice this. He was separated unto the gospel of God. And I love this. You see, Christians are to be separated. Christians are to be different. We are to stand out. <laughs> we are to stand out uh, like a diamond in a coal mine. We are to be different. Uh, the people in this church ought to be different than the people out there. We are sheepfold. But you know, in many, many churches, we don't hear anything about separation anymore. We're afraid we're going to offend somebody. And so rather than being a sheepfold, we become a zoo. Christians are to be different. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17, Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. So we are to be separate. But I want you to notice a key word in this phrase, separated unto the gospel. Now, if you just have, don't mind taking a, uh, making a mark in your Bible, mark that word unto. It is not primarily separation from, it is separation unto the gospel. It is not a negative separation, it is a positive separation. Now, the kind of separation that Paul had already been doing was the separation of a Pharisee. The very word Pharisee implies separation. Paul is separated. He probably lived a less worldly life than many of you here today, but he had not been separated unto the gospel. And that's, you know, some people say, well, I'm a, I live a separated Christian life. I don't smoke and I don't chew and I don't go with the girls who do. I am separated. <laughs> well, a fence post doesn't smoke or chew or go with girls who do. So you don't have any more religion than a fence post if that's what your separation is. And quitting those things will not make you one whit more like the Lord Jesus Christ. You can walk the straight and narrow, I don't do this, I don't do this, I don't do this, I don't do this, and you'll be a proud, bitter Pharisee. That's what Paul was before he met the Lord Jesus Christ. He was already a Pharisee. He was already separated from. But now he is separated too. And that is the difference. And it is a wonderful, wonderful difference. Actually, the word separated here, it, it's the word in the Greek that we get our word horizon from. Have you ever been up on a tall building and just looked as far as you could see until the earth dips over? That is your horizon, okay? It actually is two words. It means from off the horizon. Now, what, why, would, why would that word be translated separated? Well, you see, when your center changes, your horizon changes. Isn't that right? A boy's looking for a girlfriend, and he dates Susie, he dates Mary, he, he dates uh, Debbie, he dates this girl and that girl. And then one day, he meets Jane. And Jane becomes the center of his life. From there on, his horizon is different. You see, your horizon changes when your center changes. And when Jesus Christ is the center of your life, then your entire horizon has changed. Do you understand what we're talking about? See, that's the kind of separation that, that the Apostle Paul is talking about. He is separated unto the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, is Christ the center of your life? If Christ is the center of your life, you're going to be separated unto the gospel of Christ. If you're enjoying this message from Adrian Rogers and would like to dig a little deeper into today's topic, Download this free companion Bible study. Use the link above to get yours. Now, that's the author of the book. Now, let's talk a little bit about the hero of the book because every, every good book uh, of this genre not only has an author, but it has a hero. Now, who is the hero of the book? Well, verses 2 and 3. He's, uh, verses 1 through 3. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, 
There he puts Jesus right in the first verse. Called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God, which he hath promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Now, no doubt about who the hero of this book is. No doubt about who, uh, who this book is written about. This book is written about the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the center of that, that circumscribes Paul's horizon. And so he begins right away to talk about the Lord Jesus. Now, let's see what he says about Jesus. Are you ready? First of all, he says he is the promised one. Look, if you will. It says here in verse 2, Jesus, which he hath promised afore by his prophets, by the Holy Scriptures. Now, Paul is not inventing a new religion. The Old Testament, when Paul said the Holy Scriptures, folks, the New Testament had not been written. Paul, when he says Holy Scriptures, he's talking about the Old Testament. He's talking about Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. He is talking about the Old Testament. He's talking about Isaiah and Jeremiah and Daniel. He's talking about the Psalms. And he says Jesus was promised in all of the Old Bible. Now you have to understand this. One of the ways that we know that Jesus Christ is the Messiah is fulfilled prophecy. There's absolutely no way that these prophecies could have been fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ by accident. It is a statistical monstrosity to say that these prophecies just happen to be fulfilled in the Lord Jesus. One wise man said that after Saul met the Lord Jesus on the road to Damascus. You remember, he went out into Arabia. He went out into the desert. And he went out there with uh, the books of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms in his knapsack. And he came out of the desert with Galatians and Ephesians and Romans in his heart and in his mind. Why? Because now since he'd been saved, he opened the Old Testament and on every page he saw Jesus. And so will you. And if you read the Old Testament and you don't see Jesus, go back and read it again. For Jesus Christ himself said concerning the Old Testament, search the scriptures, for these are they which do testify of me. And so put down concerning the hero of the book, he's the promised one. <laughs> and then put down concerning the Lord Jesus, he is the provided one. Look in verse 3, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. Now that's his humanity. He was a descendant of David, a rightful heir to Israel's throne, <laughs> made of the seed of David according to the flesh. Now notice, and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. So in these verses, you see his absolute humanity and you see his absolute deity. He is the God-man. He, he is the seed of David according to the flesh. He's declared to be the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead. Now Jesus was not a divine man. Uh, that, that is foolishness. Uh, neither was Jesus a human God. Jesus, listen carefully, you'll miss this. We're talking theology now. Jesus was and is the God-man. The God-man. The God-man. Not a divine man. Not a human God. He is the God-man. He is declared to be the Son of God with power. This verse speaks of his absolute humanity, his absolute deity. It is as much a heresy to deny his humanity as it is to deny his deity. But now watch it. Jesus, the hero of the book, he's the promised one. Jesus is the provided one. He, he, he is the seed of David. He's born into this world, born of a virgin. But not only that, the Lord Jesus is the powerful one. How do we know? Well, you say fulfill prophecy. Yes, but is there better proof than that? Well, look in verse 4. And declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. He walked out of that grave, folks. Well, you say, how do I know that happened? The Bible says he showed himself alive by many infallible proofs. Scholars have said there's more proof that Jesus Christ rose from the dead than there is that Julius Caesar lived. 
If you do not believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, it is not because you have genuine intellectual problems. You can believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He is declared to be the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead. He lives. He walked out of that grave. He walked out of that grave. Paul now, I'm talking about an intellectual genius has no ifs, ands, doubts, stutter, stammer, apology about it. He says that he's alive. And he went everywhere preaching the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Jesus is the hero of this book. But not only was the Lord Jesus the promised one, not only is the Lord Jesus the provided one, not only is Jesus the powerful one, shown to be the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead. But friend, he is the pure one. Look, if you will, again. The Bible says, according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. He was absolutely, totally in his humanity as well as in his deity, sinless. Now, let's quickly kind of wrap up. The, folks, we're not getting anywhere fast, but we're having fun. All right, now listen. We gave you the table of contents. We told you who the author is. We told you who the hero is. Now let me tell you what the subject is. Every book has to have a theme. It has to have a subject. Well, the subject is the gospel. Notice verse 1. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel, separated unto the gospel of Christ or the gospel of God. Now the subject is the gospel. And, it, it, and I want you to see that very much. He calls it the gospel of God's Son. Now, in verse 1, it is the gospel of God's Son. It didn't originate with Adrian. It didn't originate with the Baptists. It didn't originate with Bellevue. It is the gospel of God's Son. He says in Galatians chapter 1, verse 12, For I neither received it from man, neither was I taught it by, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, Paul said in this Galatians chapter 1, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that which I have preached unto you, let him be accursed. Phillips translates that, let him be damned. You see, it would be far better to say two and two is 19 than to preach any other gospel. There is but one gospel. And in verse 1, it is called the gospel of God. Don't tamper with the gospel. Now, Paul said in Galatians, there's some who are preaching another gospel which is not another. What he meant by that was, it's a synthetic gospel. Well, a synthetic gospel, a false gospel, leads to a synthetic salvation that leads to a very real, a very real hell. Paul was not bigoted when he said this. The source of the gospel. Now, now listen, the subject of the entire book is the gospel, and the source of the gospel, we find it right there in verse 1, it is the gospel of God. And the subject of the gospel... Verse 3, concerning his son, Jesus Christ. Now, I want to say this very quickly. Time is running. But this is not a gospel that mentions Jesus. Not a gospel that alludes to Jesus. Jesus is the gospel. Do you know why we have churches that are filled today with moral whirlings? They have religion, but they've never met Jesus Christ. Christianity is not a creed, not a code, not a cause. It is Christ. You can take Buddha out of Buddhism and still have Buddhism. You can take Mohammed out of Islam and still have Islam. You can take Confucius out of Confucianism and still have Confucianism. But you cannot take Jesus Christ out of Christianity and still have Christianity. It's like taking the water out of a well, notes out of music, numbers out of mathematics. So many people have had an encounter with religion, but the source of the gospel is God. The subject of the gospel is His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, concerning His Son, the Lord Jesus. Now watch this finally. The supply of the gospel is grace. Look, if you will, in verse 6. He speaks of this, uh, of this gospel, or, or verse 5, rather, by whom we have received grace and apostleship. The, 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 the supply of the gospel is grace. How are you saved? How was I saved when as a teenage boy I prayed and said, Lord Jesus, come into my heart and forgive my sin. You know, I went down the aisle in a church and uh, I went forward and they met me up here and they shook my hand and they set me on the front row and said, what is your name? 
I said, Adrian Rogers. Well, Adrian, why'd you come today? I said, well, I want to be saved. No, they said, Adrian, did you want to be saved? Yes, sir. Well, how do you spell your name? So forth, so forth. Thank you, Adrian. That's what happened. And then they lined us up across the front. My dad was in that line, and I was in that line. And they said, uh, we're happy today that Adrian has come to give his heart to Jesus. Well, I guess they were happy. I'd been a terror in the neighborhood. <laughs> they said, we're happy today that Adrian has come to give his heart to Jesus. And you know, I was sincere when I went down that aisle. But folks, I was a bundle of ignorance. Nobody really ever explained to me the gospel. I was very sincere. I wanted to do better. I needed God. I wanted God. I had a burden of sin. <laughs> and, and you know, to be honest, I think probably I was saved right then. But I rode a roller coaster up and down and up and down. I didn't have that assurance of my salvation. Two or three years. But I began to read the Word of God. I began to understand what I'm teaching you today from the book of Romans. And one day I saw it. Randy, it's grace all the way. It's grace all the way. I stopped at the corner of 38th Street and Calvin Avenue in West Palm Beach, Florida. And I said, God, I don't know whether I'm saved or lost. I don't know whether I'm saved and the devil's trying to make me doubt it or I'm lost and the Holy Spirit has me under conviction. But Lord, right now with all of my heart, once and for all, now and forever, as much as in me is, I didn't bow my head. I looked straight up into the stars. I said, Lord Jesus, I receive your grace. I trust you to save me. And that settles it. And a river of peace began to flow in my heart. Friend, the source of the gospel is God. The subject of the gospel is Jesus. The supply of the gospel is grace. A little boy got, came down the aisle one time in a church and they asked him, son, how'd you get saved? He said, well, I did my part and God did his. They knew something was wrong with that. They said, son, you better explain that. He said, I did the sinning and he did the saving. <laughs> That's the gospel. That's the gospel. That's what this whole book is about. Poor, lost, ruined sinners such as we are saved by the glorious gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ.